Good morning. Happy Friday. This is not going to be my normal content because I don't think this is something that you guys care about, but I thought it was very interesting and oddly satisfying to do. There is a channel out there, Legal Eagle. And that's the name of the channel, Legal Eagle. It's a well-dressed and dapper looking man who is apparently a lawyer. Maybe he's an attorney. I don't know. He calls himself a lawyer, <clears throat> presumably in the state of California. And he uh, goes through and analyzes movies, apparently. Figure out what crimes are in the movies, what we're seeing. Look at it like a lawyer seems to be his catchphrase. Anyway, uh, he, he hears, apparently, that... Captain Marvel, who turns out to be a woman. I never even knew that, but I'm not a comic book geek. There's apparently some uproar in the uh, fedora-wearing sphere about Captain Marvel. There was a scene where a biker guy, you know, those, those big bad biker guys, you know how they're just the scum of the earth, apparently. Uh tries to flirt with her, walks up to her. She has a map up in front of her, blocking her view of him, which I think is crucial. Well, one of the many crucial things. He gently and politely, I mean, he's trying to flirt with her. He's not trying to grab her titty or anything. Reaches up, pulls the map down a little bit and says something along the lines of how about a smile. She offers him a handshake instead. He accepts the handshake. She crushes his grip brutally, steals his, demands the keys to his motorcycle and his jacket. And I am told that it's an homage to Terminator 2. The uh, legal eagle says that uh, in his view, it was not only legally, but morally justified. And I am just, I am just shocked that someone who supposedly writes, writes practice exams for law students could be that fucking retarded. And so here's, here's my argument as to why Legal Eagle is, at least on this issue, a fucking retard. Uh, number one, he plays fast and loose with battery slipping in and out of California's battery statute and California's uh, civil battery. This is taking place in California. He identifies it as some strip mall in, in California. So California statutes would apply because we have our, our lawyer hats on kids. So be very, be very wary of anybody who plays fast and loose with, are we talking about civil battery or are we talking about the crime of battery? There's a difference between them. Um, lots of things can be offensive. Lots of things can irritate you. But the state is only going to get involved under its own, essentially, motivation if it's something that is egregious. So number one, you'd have a hell of a time on a very minor issue getting a prosecutor to prosecute. You'd have a hard time getting a jury to convict, and they've been held out to be different. They're 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 looked at differently. Um, they're worded similarly, but they're they're looked at differently. If you look at the uh, Calcrim jury instructions for simple battery, you'll notice um, a few things. Uh, number one, it talks about it talks about touching in a rude or angry way. Now, you can make an argument that the gentleman touching the map was being rude. How rude. But I don't think most people are going to see that as being rude. And, and that may be my bias, but most people are going to see that. And I think the, the general outcry of people being upset over that scene, of seeing Captain Marvel as a villain, shows that that wasn't rude. And it's not just because she has a vagina. Most men are very protective of people with vaginas and give them extra special protection. In fact, that 
it's people with vagina, which is why we have the offensive in there. Battery is basically the harmful or offensive touching of another. Willful, harmful, and offensive touching. You have to intend to, you have to intend to touch them. The offensive touching is is for things that don't rise to sexual battery, like a man, you know, grabbing a woman by the arm and saying, "Hey, babe, come dance," when she doesn't want to dance, or you know, touching her through her clothes, to rubbing her breasts. That's offensive touching. That doesn't rise to to sexual battery, but it's it's offensive touching, and that's what that's what that statute is is talking about. Now the now civil battery is a little bit looser, a little bit broader. Civil battery is anything that any reasonable person would find offensive. Constitutes the offensive part. Number one, you had to be offended by it, and number two, any reasonable person had to be offended by it. They are a little bit different. As far as as far as what you have to touch for it to be considered battery, they're different too. If again, if you look at the jury instructions for criminal battery, the Judicial Council of California has said, you know, we can't find any authority to suggest that touching something connected to a person can be criminal battery. Now, there's lots of stuff saying that touching something connected to a person can be civil battery. Lots and lots of stuff suggesting that. If you're holding a map and someone bats the map down, doesn't make any contact with you, you could sue them for battery. That's the civil battery. But if they bat the map away, it's very unlikely that they'll be charged with, and it's even less likely they'll be convicted of the crime of battery. Uh, he, he equates it to... Uh, he, he gives two examples in his in his video. Number one is touching you through your clothes. Like if someone punches you in your chest and you're wearing a shirt on, obviously they haven't touched you, but they've touched your clothes, which are so intimately a part of you. The law is going to consider your clothes to be you. You're you're wearing your clothes. I mean, unless unless they're catching a shirt tail that's completely out of the way. Eh, if if it if the impact of it transfers through your clothes to hit you, then as far as the uh, law is concerned that's that's touching you but things that are connected to you would be things like in your hands he, he uses a cell phone batting a cell phone out of somebody's hands would that be charged as battery uh that's debatable uh that's debatable i mean there are lots of there are lots of potentials out there it could be charged as it i mean prosecutors do tend to overcharge on lots of things try to throw the whole book at you But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they will charge you on it. And it certainly doesn't mean you'd be convicted of it. And as far as assault is concerned, in order for there to be assault, either the criminal or the civil, you have to see the harmful or offensive touching on its way. You have to be in fear of it. You have to be placed in immediate fear, immediate apprehension of harmful or offensive touching. If you remember back, he keeps throwing assault in there. Uh, if you remember back, uh, there is a map betwixt and between herself and the biker. So she doesn't see the harmful or offensive touching coming. And so it clearly cannot be, until he makes contact with the map. And so it clearly cannot be assault. Uh, Legal Eagle makes a big deal about him being in her space. There is no legal in her space. There is no crime of being in someone's space. And then he says that uh, because the biker applied force by by depressing the paper map, the folding paper map, I mean, my God, the folding paper map. Don't they have cell phones? But anyway, by slightly, by gently depressing the paper map, Legal Eagle insinuates that that the biker has applied enough force to justify self-defense. Well, here's the fun thing about self-defense. It has to be commensurate. It has to be, it has to be equal to the amount of force 
It's, it's enough force to make the attack stop. That's basically what you're allowed to do. You can't go overboard. Now he says that you just can't escalate it from, you just can't escalate it from uh, non deadly force to deadly force. And I don't think so. There's a lot of case law out there where it it turns on like somebody's somebody's poking you in the chest. Did you push them away and then they fell and hit their head? Or did you punch them and then they fell and hit their head? There's a difference between the two and the law recognizes that. And maybe you'd be justified. A jury might find you were justified in using the the pushing amount of force to push someone away who's poking you in the chest, jabbing their finger into your chest. But they may not may they may find that you are not justified in punching that person away. And uh, and Legal Eagle does mention that uh, most analysis, most legal analysis, is very fact based. And he ignores he ignores completely the entire time in his factual um, analysis that she's a fucking superhero and he might be a big bad man with a penis but she's a superhero and she is able to crush his hand with her grip strength she it's not it's not a level playing field so it's questionable I mean she gets beat up by aliens and stuff from what I understand I haven't again I'm not familiar with it but She's a superhero, so she's fighting something. That that big guy with the with the hand that turns all sorts of colors, whoever he is, he's got to be an alien, right? Anyway, so so she fights she fights super villains and wins. They don't they don't kill her. So it'd be a real world analysis would be like a professional boxer getting into a getting into a kerfuffle with, I don't know, just with me, you know, it's, if I, if I walk up to a, a professional boxer and I, and I clap him on the shoulder, Hey man, Hey, I saw your fight. Great fight. And he took offense to that. That doesn't mean that he could just full on lay me out. Mike Tyson me. So the, uh, the response has to, has to uh, be proportionate to the amount of force being applied to you. It has to be enough force to, to stop the attack, but it can't be more. It has to be reasonable. And it also has to be somewhat immediate. Uh, in, the, in the scene, she puts the map down. She says... Instead of a smile, I'll give you a handshake and holds out her hand. There is obviously no threat. She is obviously not responding. She's not defending herself at this point. He smiles and shakes her hand. That's a good faith gesture. That is, that is obviously not someone who's intending to assault. She has invited the contact at that point. And then she goes about crushing his hand. Is that... Is that commensurate? Is that equal force to him depressing a paper map? I would submit to you that it is not. It is also not responding to that. That is over. That was done. They shook hands. They literally shook hands. It was done. When you shake hands, it's over. That's the law. That's man law. And then... There is no amount of self-defense that would ever justify theft. She stole his motorcycle and his jacket. That's theft. There's no self-defense will never justify theft. So it just amazes me that Legal Eagle is trying to justify this. Now his his final moral, his final moral, uh, I don't know, argument, I guess you could call it that, is that this scene is somehow an homage to Terminator 2. Now, I have seen Terminator 2, so I can, I can opine with some, at least, knowledge of what the hell I'm talking about. Um, he says it's essentially a shot-for-shot shot of the scene, the beginning scene of Terminator 2, 
where Terminator appears in the bar and naked and he basically robs the jacket and the keys from a biker and he ends up walking out with a shotgun and sunglasses or something like that if and I remember correctly anyway that is correct and he says well you know Terminator was the hero in Terminator 2 and he was hero-esque he was essentially an anti-hero he was the the bad guy he was the bad guy who was just better than the good guy or I'm sorry just better than the real bad guy um, there's a very tame version of that in Han Solo a smuggler he's the bad guy you know Luke Skywalker was the hero Han Solo was a bad guy but he was just less bad than Darth Vader the same kind of thing with uh, with Terminator in Terminator 2. He was a bad guy. He was a soulless machine. But there was a... He, he started off at the very beginning of the movie. He's, he's not... He is very amoral. He has a single... He's single-minded in his mission. He's there to protect the kid. I forget the kid's name. And there is a difference between that and a hero... A hero does heroic things. You know, it's the difference between uh, Superman and uh, what's that Spider-Man looking guy? Uh, the spot Deadpool. They're they're both heroes, but one is a hero, the other one is an anti-hero. One of them is is you know good and justice in the American way and apple pie, and the other one is well, I get the job done very ends justify the means kind of thing. So when you're taking when you're taking a character that is intended to be a hero and you're having them do anti-hero things, you're muddling the message. You expect your heroes to be heroes, you expect your anti-heroes to be anti-heroes. And I might be misusing anti-hero, but I think you guys I think you guys figure out what I'm trying to say. They're, they're the bad guys who are the hero of the story. The, uh, the rogue. So I don't think his moral argument was really particularly on point. Um, it was wrong when Terminator 2 did it, but it was expected for his character. It was expected for him to do that. Because didn't he do that in the original movie too? I'm mixing them up now because they're both the same guy. But anyway, you get my point. Anyway, that was my analysis of it. There's a long, a long walk and talk for you. Thanks for, thanks for sticking through it with me. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, even lawyers can be wrong sometimes, especially if they're on YouTube. Your, your mistakes are perpetually encapsulated in a time machine. Have a great day.